It was it was kind of a, a surprise thing, at a, an unplanned thing, because uh, you know after confinement and everything, I was really longing. Uh, 2019 was very active. I went to Pitcairn. I was part of BP6R and traveled a lot. Uh, radio related. I'm about to finish a movie, a documentary, a feature length documentary about ham radio. Uh, and I'm in the process of shooting the last scenes. Uh, so everything clicked. And I'm a good friend of Ken and Erwan, the two guys that started running this show. And I asked them if there was a place and they popped me in. And it was a very fast thing. Uh, it, it started as an outing of uh, five uh, crazy uh norwegians you know like a weekend or week out in camping and it ended up being a little the expedition uh and a very fun one uh for us so on this first slide uh you can see um more or less where we were left in the middle of nowhere uh, this island okay i'm gonna up, uh, wait a second okay <laughs> So um, we were uh, six hams, a hunter, a professional outdoors man, you will meet Ronnie, uh, and two huskies, two rented husky dogs, uh, because this is in the middle of a polar bear territory. Uh, the first thing that arrived in my hand, Ken sent me this fat PDF giving instructions on what to do if you met a polar bear, where to shoot uh, the signal flare for him to run. And, you know, I thought it was just like Scandinavian overprotection compared to, you know, I'm from Barcelona, I don't know anything. So, okay, I read the document and in the end there was a, a, a like a line to sign. So the government would know that you read that. So uh, polar bears were a thing. All through the planning, we took the Hunter, two big high caliber guns, uh, the flare guns. We had 24 hours a day polar bear watch that we switched and shared with the hunter anyway. So polar bears, we were going to polar bear uh, territory. Uh, Ken was the leader of the, the expedition. He was the one that started it together with Air One, LB1AQI and LA7GIA. Um, then we had LA8OM, Chris, a uh, very, very proficient CW operator, one of those machines. He just sits and blah, 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 goes. Uh, Rune, uh, <laughs> the soul of the, the expedition, uh, very, very experienced uh, old timer ham and have been uh, around the world because of his uh, work uh, experience. Uh, Germund, uh, he's been licensed for a year and a half and he's already on Bouvet. He's like a, a fast one and very, very, very fun guy. And that's me, uh, that's uh, courtesy of Ken. That's how he uh, pictures his friends. I'm after my polar bear guard and my CW run. I'm completely toasted. And you will see why. That's the only heated place we had for a week. And this is Ronnie on the left. That's our hunter. Uh, hunter, I mean, he's an outdoors man, but uh, he's the one that knew how to uh, manage the weapons. And then you see Fem and me. Five and nine are two husky dogs, uh, which turned into, you know, wolf dogs, and they lost completely their their dignity the moment we arrived on the beach, and they were like cuddly, cuddly pets. Uh, in the in this little island, it's an an inhabited island. There's there are no humans there, but there's a permanent colony of uh, walruses, really really close to camp, maybe forty meters away. So. Uh, that was something. That was like watching a movie. Uh, apart, uh, apart from the incredible landscapes and and the changing weather, for me, I'm a Peruvian, and I live in Spain. For me, it was like going to another planet. Besides, those guys were fun, big, big, big time, and that's one thing that I will say in the in the conclusion. So, where did we go? Uh, this is the Svalbard Archipelago. It's inside the the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's uh, it, it's part of Norway, but it has a shared sovereignty with Russia. So there are like Russian towns somewhere. We didn't have time to go and see that, uh, but it's definitely worth a trip. And from from the main city uh, in Svalbard, uh, we took a boat around two hours and a half. 
to that island. That's Prince Carl Forland's island. And we were right in that uh, where the arrow appears, that point, the, the, the easternmost uh, tip of the island. That's where uh, Ken thought the uh, sound to camp. Uh, because we had takeoff to everywhere. Our main goals uh, were North America, West Coast, and JA and Asia, especially. And we knew we were going to have Europe uh, for sure, a lot. Uh, and that's how it turned out. But that was an incredible spot. As you can see there, uh, those little three buildings are, one is uh, like a little hut for the governor, which is closed, and two are uh, weather stations. And that's where we set camp. Uh, the green thing that you see on the bottom of the screen is water. There's like an entry of water from the ocean. Uh, so we basically had salty water. We were on that bar and we had salty water for our verticals and BDAs and dipoles. We had salty water in all of the directions. The, the, the place was incredible and it, it, it proved incredible. I was, uh, we were all really happy. Um, so uh, we did like the walruses do, uh, and on a good day, we gathered uh, at the Oslo airport. Uh, for many, it was their first flight in uh, two years, maybe. Uh, there's even uh, the expedition office in Norway, expedition. So, you know, we went there just to say we were going, I'm just uh, kidding, a Spanish joke, a bad Spanish joke. And we arrived to Long Yearburn. Long Yearburn is like the civilization inside Svalbard. That's the main building that you will see. That's like a mall with some restaurants and uh, uh, an ex-coal mining town. All the things that you see parked there on the bottom uh, are uh, snowmobiles, because in the winter it's uh, minus uh, 16, 18 degrees. So it's completely covered with snow. It's an ex-coal mining uh, town. Uh, you can see that you know the the houses are raised uh, because of the snow. Kind of a green place with an incredible atmosphere because it's full of young people from all over the world, from Chile, from Norway, of course. They go there. It's tax-free. There's a, a a branch of the Arctic University, uh, and they go there and spend a year working. So the the, the place is kind of dark, but uh, the people there were incredible. That's uh, what the old coal mines look like. You know, you had to go to climb on the snow every day to work there inside. So that's us. We wake up and we load all our crap. Meaning all our crap. It's all our crap everything. We had to take uh, toilet paper, all the food, everything, because we were going to be dropped in a beach for a week. Uh, that's us in the little pier. On the right, uh, in the upper uh, left corner, you can see the captain, the Russian captain, uh, <laughs> trying to see how it will fit all our toys there inside. Uh, we managed to fit everything, and we departed uh, towards the island. It's a two hour and a half three hour uh, boat ride. We, we saw some puffins horribly photographed by me, but you know, at least there's a proof. There were a lot. Uh, and our dogs sleeping already, living the, the large, the big life. And we arrived here at Polypinten. Polypinten, uh, where you see the boat, uh, it's right that that's right at the, at the point we were uh, camping. And you can see towards the south, we have ocean. Towards the northwest, we have ocean, and in that uh, that that uh, sandbar that we were camping, we had an entry of swell ocean for maybe I don't know 50 or 60 meters. So yeah, prime prime vertical uh, land there. And as the protocol uh, requires in the in polar bear territory, the first to disembark is the guy with the guns and the dogs, and of course, a crew member. You can see the crew member, the Swedish guy is not really happy. He's there, okay, it's my turn. We didn't know what was at the other side of the beach. So he goes and he sees everything and the dogs smell and there wasn't polar bears. Uh, so our boat, you know, starts departing and leaves us uh, there. That's a gentry I made for, uh, for K9 Papa Golf. He collects these pictures, I don't know why. Uh, so uh, we were left there in the middle of uh, nowhere and uh, with the promise to be picked up uh, in a week, a WX-ray permitting. 
there were some tourists that visited two times, you know, the, the walrus colony. So we kind of had a link. I took a satellite phone to just in case uh, we didn't need it, actually. Uh, but uh, we were there. <laughs> So the first thing was set up a camp. We set up the tents and uh, started setting up antennas. The biggest tent was a radio tent. You can see it there on the right. Uh, and I will talk about the antennas and the equipment uh, a little bit later. So we set up our uh, little kitchen. I, I took uh, delicacies from Spain, weird canned food that everyone loved, and they took their weird Norwegian food. It was like a like a gastronomic festival. It was cold. We were usually between uh, minus two uh, or minus one up to three or four or five during the day, depending on, on the wind gusts. Uh, but there wasn't a night, so it was daylight, uh, 24 hours a day. My bear shift was from 2 to 4 a.m., and it was broad daylight. Boom, I heard my alarm. I took out my face cover, and, and I grabbed the gun. So... That was crazy, too, uh, of those uh, upper latitudes. Uh, we are gentlemen, of course. We had to take a loo. We voted. We voted on that loo. There was a part of these rough Norwegians that said, no, you go to the swell and do your things. I said, no, come on. You know, we, we need to rent this. How much is to rent this? It's actually a loo that you kind of wear. It's more like a jacket for all of us uh, big guys, but still gave us a, a little bit of uh, dignity on those uh, hard camping moments. I'm sorry, but if anyone wants to plan at the expedition, that's something you really need to take into account. Uh, so antennas, OK? Uh, Ken uh, is a man of uh, principles, and he said, spider beams. Let's not start taking uh, aluminum masts and beams because it's going to be crazy on weight. He was completely right. We were on the top uh, of what we could load on the boat. So it was all spider poles and wires. And we split it. For example, I did the two, uh, two elevated radial uh, ground planes for 17 and 15. Another one grabbed another two bands. So we kind of split. And we built and tested and had all the hardware and were responsible for all the hardware, the balloon and everything of all the antennas we built from our homes. So when we got together in Oslo, we knew it was working. And that's something that really worked out well. So this was the queen of our antennas. Uh, we got inspired by Vincent uh, and built a VDA for 20 meters, uh, a vertical dipole array uh, for 20 meters, a two element vertical Yagi kind of uh, made of wire. And it was a cannon. These antennas have this uh, radiation pattern when they are very close to the sea, they have an incredible lobe away from the island and a very small one towards the island. That's exactly what you need uh, when you are on an island uh, doing a, the expedition. So uh, next time, I think I would take all of these. We had only one for 20, and we had other antennas for other bands, but this one, we were all fighting for it. We all wanted to, to do 20, and 20 ended up being the money band. You will see later. Too. Uh, this is almost at the end of the, the, the expedition. The weather has gone uh, crappy already. Look at the BDA, all twisted, still working. QRO, boom, 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 until the last minute. And then on the left, you can see, you know, a dipole that uh, that kind of bent a little bit too much. But, you know, that's everything starts beautiful, and then it starts uh, getting ruined. We had the 40-meter dipole. That's a thing to uh, have in mind. Those heavy QRO balloons put a big strain on the spider beam poles. Uh, this, this spider beam pole, uh, it was the only casualty, the only one that uh, broke for us. But uh, very, very important to find a light balloon. I have an example. I found one for the 17 meter one, and it worked very, very well. Uh, so we had uh, for 60, 40, and 30, we had uh, ground planes with ground radials. Uh, spider poles just put on the ground and not even uh, dug, just put on the ground and guy wired and they withstood the winds. We had strong winds, no problem at all. Uh, that's more or less how our camp uh, could be seen. That was our antenna farm. And the radio tent was in the middle. Uh, this is the casualty. Uh, this is the one that, uh, that oh, I'm sorry. This is the one that broke, uh, the 18-meter one. 
Okay, so for power, uh, we took two Ondas EU30i, uh, three point something uh, kilowatt each output. Uh, we grounded both separately with ground rods, and we fed two separate circuits, one for two stations, one for three stations. The two stations could run more power, the other stations could run a little less power. In average, we could run 700 watts uh, full carrier uh, at every one of our stations without a problem at all and have all the accessories and the pieces running. Uh, uh, so uh, Germund uh, that took care of this uh, made an amazing job. He all, they, all, they also built RFI filters because these uh, Honda generators are very silent, but they can put out some uh, RFI. Uh, so those lines are filtered with a big uh, build RFI filter uh, like a choke. So we didn't have any noise problem, a little bit of interaction, you know, where we, but the space wasn't much spread out, but but it was, it worked very well. The plans uh, happened to work. So this is our tent. Uh, this is our tent the second day. As you can see, we are all wearing jackets because we couldn't uh, make that um, paraffin uh, military heater work. Uh, that was the second day. Then we managed to make it run. And oh, we tried to spend as much time there because it was the only hot place. Uh, so we set up, you know, the five stations there. Uh, basically, what we were using uh, were for linears, uh, we had Jumas and experts. And the rigs were a flex. Uh, uh, we had one flex and, and a couple of uh, Elecraft K3s and two KX3s. Uh, so basically, everybody took their own uh, station. I took my cameras, so I couldn't uh, take my own station. Uh, so I was just jumping from one to the other. Uh, I'm talking there with our pilot uh, that I want to thank from here, Whiskey for India, Papa Charlie, little Connor there in the States that we had a problem. Someone started calling on the West Coast, so I gave him a, a telephone call. That was the only time we really needed to use the phone there. So uh, kind of, you know, in an overview, uh, we were 4.5 days on the air uh, with five stations. Uh, we were six operators jumping around. Uh, it was free to choose which mode we use, which band we run. You went into the tent. If 17 was uh, uh, free on the matrix, you would hook up. The, the amplifier uh, to the matrix and run that band. Very, very open, the uh, open and, and you could decide if you wanted to go sightseeing, you could go. Uh, uh, Ken did there a very nice uh, design on the schedule. So it was fun. Uh, we pulled 16,000 cues uh, in total. Uh, you will see the stats later, but most of them in, in CW and SSB. Uh, 8.590 unique calls and uh, 115 DXCC is work. Uh, you know, it's not that we were in a super rare place, but we were there during IOTA contest. So during IOTA, it was a blast. Uh, those don't count as Valbard. They count the EU63 counts as a coastal islands or something like that. So anyway, very, a lot of radio fun. Uh, we didn't stop a second. So here are the numbers kind of crunched. Uh, uh, there was a bet uh, from the team on 40. I was doubting that, but still, we had uh, nice antennas for 40. And 40 proved to be uh, not very good already into the summer and into a new cycle. 20 was incredible, and 17 was a nice surprise, too. You can see there in red. Uh, but 20 was definitely the money band. And 20 was the, the, the band that we have, the BDA. Uh, plus a uh, dipole. So anyway, 20 was the, the fun band for sure. Uh, here are the QSOs uh, per continent. Uh, uh, we wanted to focus on the West Coast and Asia and knew we were going to have some EU. That's, that's the deal. EU, the Europe was coming like cannons uh, as usual. And uh, we had a lot of North America, a lot of West Coast. I was surprised. Uh, during planning, I said, are you guys sure? because they run some propagation simulations. And are you sure West Coast? Wow, it's a, it's, it's a feat from Spain. Uh, and definitely Whiskey 6 after Whiskey 6 after Whiskey 6, and then JAs on the other side. It was a, 
everything went according to plan, which is not usually the case, you know, in adventures like this. Uh, I'm still impressed. Uh, here are the queues per mode, 64% uh, CW, 27% uh, SSB and 9% FT8. Uh, some people were doing more FT8, whichever. There were some that only ran CW. Uh, I did both. I mean, it was like a free distribution, and that's how I ended up. It ended up. It shows kind of like we are <laughs> an old crowd. Uh, and yes, uh, finally uh, we had a visit. Uh, the visit we were all waiting and doing polar bear guards and everything. Uh, we were visited by a mother polar bear and her juvenile cub. I can't show the video here because that's kind of the end of the movie. Uh, and that's uh, disclosed material, but you know it. You will see it. That movie, you will watch it for sure. So um, that's a polar bear. It was 400 meters away. This is photographed through the site in the rifle I had with the mobile phone. Uh, but luckily... Uh, you know, we saw polar bears, uh, but we didn't have to engage them. That's me and Ervan, the two hot-blooded Mediterranean guys. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to engage them because they would have laughed and, and then eaten us. We being zero afraid of us. We weren't a menace for that huge beast. I think they smelled and they said, these guys, I think they already went bad. Hams, ooh, let's go. And they just left. We were lucky, but we were like this. It was like a big adrenaline rush. Uh, and we can uh, die saying uh, we saw a polar bear. We had many, 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 many uh, individual and corporate sponsors, which uh, we are super thankful for. Clipperton DX, uh, Far East The Exploiters, Mac, a brewery. Uh, up there north, the farthest north brewery in the world, uh, Funk Amateur, uh, the German uh, dark uh, magazine, DX World, Ham Supply, and of course our super dearest uh, Charles, M0 Oscar, X-Ray Oscar, we had to suffer all, all our chaos with our, all our network logs going crazy and and you know we love you charles and a lot of uh, single hams uh, that supported us this was a very uh, small trip very lean in terms of budget it all came from our packet pockets and what we received as, as donations came back to us a little bit of a uh, as a refund and and you know uh, any any support in these small ones uh, makes a big uh, difference we we hope uh, to have put uh, wanted Island in many logs. We had a lot of fun. It looked like at the other side, there was a lot of fun too. So, and I would repeat with those people, I would go to the end of the world. Fun, loving, uh, we were pulling our legs the moment we were on the plane already. Uh, uh, good chaps, all of them. I, they have the, the official seal of approval. And uh, that's about it. And I think I went uh, too fast as usual. It's 11.26, but... I will be open for questions if there's any. And thank you very much for the patience and from bearing with my Barcelona accent here, my Peruvian accent. Thank you. <laughs> it's been fascinating. Actually, I'm in awe of your English speaking skills and, and your uh, Norwegian pronunciation as well. Uh, um, that's fantastic. Um, there aren't many. Yes, uh, just by the way, if you do have a question, please get them in on the uh, on the YouTube uh, chat, I'm looking at it uh, now. John, thank you. Has just put up a, a reminder about uh, about questions. I've got a few if uh, if you don't have. But um, I mean, you you live somewhere quite warm, um, and you your country of origin, Peru, I imagine, is is quite warm. How did you cope um, on uh, well, on this island? Well, Arctic? I've been I, I've been training in northern temperatures. I I grew up in Lima, Peru, which has the lamest weather in the world. My uh, minimum 17 degrees, maximum 29 degrees. And then I moved to Canada, to Vancouver, Canada. That, that's where I studied my second career and I spent two years there. Uh, Vancouver is still kind of easy weather uh, compared to the rest of Canada. And then I moved to Spain. I came out, uh, came uh, here after my love. Uh, so, so I had to adapt. I mean, it's, uh, it's nothing We're living here in Spain. Uh, Barcelona, right? I mean, right now we have 25 degrees outside, which is uh, nuts. It's almost uh, November. 
Uh, I can adapt. My my blood is Russian. My grandparents were immigrants from Russia in the early 20th century. So I'm finer with snow than uh, with tropical weather. So yeah, I, I adapted really, really fast. But I was the cold one. I was the 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 chilly one you know with seven uh, layers and and for them it was like a normal going to work temperature for the spring you know yes lb5 yeah. gi was bare chested there i saw in that, uh, in that yeah picture. that's funny i asked him hey what are you doing you are ruining my my epicness here for the movie and he said it's a summer trip right it's a summer so it's a summer <laughs> you know you have to Take out your shirt. This yeah. is what I was thinking. It was it was July, wasn't it? Because uh, you said it, it, uh, it was. It, it was, was, light was the whole end time. of July and the hottest temperature ever uh, there during the year, and it was four the maximum the day we were like, you know. Uh, so in the winter, it's completely covered in snow. It's a beautiful place. It's not an expensive place to travel to. Svalbard, as a general, there's a cheap flight from Oslo, SAS. Uh, and it works perfect, and there's there are all a gamut of prices of places to stay there, and a lot to see around. It's a for me, it was an incredible surprise, incredible surprise. Uh, fulfilled my expectations by far, yeah. Um, AD G6 AD, it's local to me actually. He says, uh, Whose job was it to test the heater? LOL. Um, Oh, somebody's saying thank you very much. They just received the JW0 QSL card. I think that's somebody called Matt, so I'm not too sure. And, uh, oh, uh, somebody's signing themselves as Hepto. It says, how did you get on with the walruses? Are they dangerous? Uh, no, they are not dangerous. Uh, we are dangerous there. Uh, those walruses are a huge attraction. So they give work to a lot of people. The boats that bring that bring tourists, they have all this protocol not to scare them away because walruses, that's what I was told, when they get scared, they, they could never come back to that beach. So, you know, that's a place that's two hours away. So they bring tourists once a day. They don't, you know, so we weren't allowed to disturb them. I, I shot some shots of them, but didn't get uh, too close. I, I, I guess if you get in the middle there, they are dangerous, but they don't attack people. Their, uh, their tasks are for hunting uh, for clams, giant clams. That's what they eat. So they need them for that. But uh, they are not aggressive. But they if they get scared... That was a big thing. We would have gotten a fine that we couldn't pay. <laughs> well, there can't be many de expeditions. You go on where you need to take a, a rifle and a, and a hunter and some and some dogs. Yeah. Well, uh, the hunter, it's actually a friend of GI, uh, uh, and and he's a hunter, and and he was in Canada, and he had an encounter with a bear that tried to attack uh, the exp an, an expedition, not radio related. So he knows. Uh, what to do in those cases and and he was a friend so we brought him with us and he was doing 12 hours a day uh, polar bear watch and us six ops had two hours each so he was he had he kind of had a job there uh but but everybody carries a gun there everybody 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 we had this small sailboat coming with a family and the guide a, a woman from france which happened to be a friend of erwan one of our operators jumped out out of the dinghy with a big fat gun you need to when you go on a beach the protocol is to have a gun and know how to use it and know where to shoot and train you know uh all the norwegians went to this range where they have cameras and they can train and here i went to the i ended up in the guardia civil you know and the guy told me hey, are you pulling my leg no really i need to train with a high caliber gun so i can maybe kill a polar bear so, you know, I, I think I'm, I, they have me wired already. They are listening to what I thought. I'll get so, the bears on the streets of Barcelona, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the deal. Uh, for me, it was surprising too, but uh, that's a, a, a necessity. All, all the rest, apart, of course, from the generators and the weight of everything, it was like a cold camping trip, you know? Yeah, did um, you mentioned uh, that it wasn't an expensive operation? But give us an idea of what what, what it might. Yes, cost to manage yes. Uh, uh, our budget per operator uh, was around uh, two thousand euros, and it ended up being one thousand three hundred. 
Uh, for a 10-day stay that included our boat, of course, which is the main cost usually in these adventures, you know, the boat, uh, the rental of, of the tents and everything. That was a minus, of course, getting there. They were already in Oslo. I, I was in Mallorca there and I, I flew... I flew from uh, Palma to, to Oslo. That's minus uh, flights, you know, but, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of bang for the bag. Eight days mm. in the North Pole wilderness, you know, with friends really, doing radio. You didn't really need any spending money, did you? Not on the, on the no, beach, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. No, no, no. Because Norway, I know, has a reputation of being very expensive uh, itself, but you're... Yeah, I, I I wasn't in Oslo. I I can't tell, and and yeah, it's more definitely it's more expensive, but uh, it wasn't a a huge problem, uh, really. We when when we went back, uh, went to a restaurant and had a couple of beers and had a decent uh, lunch, you know, after a, a while. Uh, but no, it wasn't a problem, and and the place Svalbard, it's it's incredible. It really feels. Like you've been traveling for long to somewhere very far, and it's right up here, even closer to you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You uh, you mentioned um, you're making a film. I'm finishing a film that I started in 2016. I'm a film director. Oh, not about is... the expedition then. No, no, no. The, in the the expedition, there's like the the last uh, scene. <laughs> which I'm not going to talk about, <laughs> but, uh, but X-rated. You know, X-rated. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there's, there are bears on it. X-rated with bears. Mm. So no, it's a, it's like a labor of love. I've been doing this out of my pocket without uh, even making my company, uh, get involved, my production company, just a thing of, you know, it was traveling with hams and shooting around the world and, and it's about to finish. I need to finish because I'm getting into a fiction project now. Uh, and and this was an opportunity, you know, a perfect setting to shoot uh, the end. So so that's that's about it. I hope to have the film ready by uh, mid-2022. I still need to fly somewhere to shoot a couple of more interviews. But uh, yeah, it's been ongoing for five years, almost six years already. Yeah. It sounds fascinating. You'll have to let us know when it's uh, when it's ready. But going back to the de-expedition, I guess the uh, the Norwegian chaps handled this. But um, did you need to convince any authorities that you were uh, that you should go there? Uh, Ken Ken has an incredible cred. Uh, he's you know every time he's gone, he's been invited to Jan Mayen. He's like military with the no impact thing, and we were all where. You know, when we finished, we did this line and we walked the beach and we picked up crap from God knows where, you know, from other guys, bags and bags and bags. And and I didn't know, for example, that we couldn't fly a drone there. I took a mini drone to shoot some aerial. And the moment uh, Ken saw it, down, down, what? No, we are not allowed. But there was no one around. No, no, we can't fly a drone. I put the drone in the... So, uh you know, in those in those countries, if you really stick to the rules and you prove it and you comply, uh, uh, you get in exchange. You know, that's I, I don't think it's easy to get a permit to camp there. But I can tell you that if you went there, the moment we left, you wouldn't have noticed we were there. You know, mm -hmm. so because it's, it's, it's a natural, it's it's a nature reserve. It's a very high level nature reserve. It's not yeah. worth upsetting them, is it? Uh, it spoils it for everybody else coming along later. Of course, I mean the 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 two or three groups of tourists they came to the wilderness and saw six stinky hams there with their antennas. That was kind of a downer, maybe. But apart from that, we didn't have any impact. Yeah. Well, talking of stinky hams, I mean, don't go into too much detail. But what was it like? No a showers. Wearable, a wearable toilet you were talking about. Uh, the wearable toilet, uh, it wasn't bad. Uh, it was uh, like a trash can. Uh, that you put a bag there, and then it had like a molded uh, toilet lid uh, that fit perfectly there. So it was thought for that. 
Uh, but we all knew that the guy going inside there was going to have a hard time. So we kind of made it a joke and that didn't help the guy that was inside because you could hear people laughing and said, oh, come on, you know, go, go away. So uh, that's, that, you know, that's one of the kinks. Um, we didn't shower, of course. Uh, we didn't change our uh, first layer of uh, clothes either much because it was cold. But there, nobody stunk. Uh, you know, at, at those temperatures near freezing, it's not the exactly same. Here, right he, yeah, yeah he, here you walk <laughs> two blocks and and you are, you know, you, you are you are sweating. That wasn't the case there. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to uh, come into uh, what it's like uh, listening in, in the Arctic. I've been in Spain and uh, I hear things in Spain on a little 817 and a Wonder Wand antenna. You can't hear at this, this north in the, uh, in the world. But uh, um, where is it? Uh, John, M GM3JW wants to know what the noise floor was like being so far north. Uh, the, the noise floor... Uh you have to take into account that we didn't do any uh, low frequency work. So uh, I can't tell you how it was in 160, 80. Uh, I even didn't even touch 40. If I see the stats for my part, I didn't even go to 40. I stayed on 20 and 17. Uh, noise floor S2, maybe. So incredible. I have a six, a seven here in the city, in the city station. Uh, but the flatter, that's something that I've always heard about and I never suffered before. Uh, the flatter is something. It's literally like if there was a monkey pulling your uh, mic plug, your, your headset plug in and out. You, it goes. So you have to pick a call on SSB from a big pile up, you know, and you are hearing kilo again, kilo one, kilo one, like crazy. That was fun, and I realized because I have a lot of friends in Alaska, my my US colleagues from Alaska, and and they've always told me when you come to you know bring your call out to the air, you will see flatter, flatter, flatter. So I experience flatter. It's crazy, but the good things is that the paths you have there up north. Uh, if I want to work JA, I have to be uh, to JA or or on the long path, but they are so close to the pole. So you hear things, the West Coast, I've never heard West Coast in Europe so loud up there. So the path was maybe polar or it's a completely different radio experience, which is something I really appreciate when I travel to the expeditions that, you know, it blows your head. It's completely different to Spain. And it's uh, four hours away, you know. Mm. Yeah, we often hear um, Scandinavian stations in the middle of the day calling CQ on 40 to West Coast. Of yeah. <laughs> I wonder what, that's, <laughs> what that is all about. Um, that that uh, flutter that you were talking about, was that to the effect of the Aurora or something like that? Yeah, to the effect of the Aurora in a weird way, because this is so north, this is 78 degrees north. And uh, the, the prime Aurora band is from 60 to 70. So we are farther north of the big auroras. If you want to see auroras during the winter, you go to Tromso, which is farther south. Uh, so uh, we were affected in a strange uh, way. Uh, uh, and, and it sometimes came and it left and it was at any, uh, any day, any hour of, of that 24 hour light day. Uh, but uh, it was like a roller coaster. It was like someone was trying to make it hard for you. You know, yeah, you wouldn't have had the benefit of benefit of seeing the aurora, would you? Be, be, no, uh, no, no. I like miss that. Shame. I miss that. I, I'm gonna. Go, I, I want to come back on the on the winter. They have this very well equipped uh, radio club right by the port in Long Yearburn, in the place where you fly to, and and they are really open and they take guests. I've heard it's kind of a noisy QTH uh, lately, but uh, yeah, I want to go there in the winter for sure. Absolutely. Um, question from a couple of questions from Dom M1 KTA. How much weight did you each carry on the flights in? Uh, around the two uh, suitcases of 23 kilos, uh, and some of us three suitcases of, of 23 kilos. Plus, we had allowed eight kilos on the carry on, and boy, we blew that like. <laughs> 
I don't know. We, we were carrying maybe 17 kilos on the carry on, you know, because you had to take your linear. In my case, my cameras. I, I, uh, so basically two or three 23 kilo uh, pieces weren't expensive in SAS. They were really reasonable. Uh, the cost of taking them. Uh, and some of them were ski bags. That's where we took the big uh, spider poles. You know, the, the 10 meet, the new 10 meter spider poles, the ones I used, they, they, they went into my duffel bag. But from 12 meters up, uh, they go into a ski bag. Yeah. Yeah. Many layers of clothes in every pocket full of stuff, I take it. Yeah. Yeah, many layers of clothes, uh, inner layer made of merino, uh, middle layers uh, made of wool too, uh, then like a, like a waterproof pant. We didn't have any precipitation, not snow, not, uh, not hail, not uh, rain, uh, but we have one day it was terribly foggy, foggy like crazy. So polar bears you know where are the polar bears going oh, yeah. to appear if you see 20 meters away <laughs> you know there are warmer places you could have gone to for a day expedition yeah, yeah but this place was was fun i mean the what, what I, was so special about going that why 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 did the you landscape you can't believe the place it's uh it's it's like being on the moon uh i don't know look uh you could say well i've gone to the south pole and this is here we haven't gone out of the continent uh that's one uh and the other one which i found later because i didn't knew most of the sorry i didn't knew most of the didn't know most of the guys uh was the team you know i had the lottery the two b the two d expeditions i've done lately Amazing people, the one on BP6R and here, which that that's the most important thing. If you plan going anywhere to a weekend outing or to a small D expedition or to a big one, is you make sure that the team is right, you know, because because there will be hardships and it's better to smile at them, you know, together than shh. I've heard horror stories too. That's what I'm saying. This. So, <laughs> if anyone wants to start planning the expeditions, find the right chaps first. Yeah. And uh, um, Dom again, M1KTA. Uh, yeah, we saw in pictures there seemed to be some logs lying around. It says it looked like you used those logs for. Did you use those logs for securing guys and stuff? Well, the the thing is that some of those logs are considered heritage, uh, and some of them. Uh, could have runes uh, in there. They, they could be there for thousands of years. Wow. So we weren't allowed to move them much. So what we, the only thing that we did is tie to some big ones, tie our guy wires, you know, that we wouldn't leave a mark or anything, or grab newer driftwood, obviously new driftwood, and put eye, eye bolts there. You know, you don't need a lot of uh, weight to hold those uh, straight, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, national monuments then. Um, oh, yes, you were talking about balance in the uh, presentation. Uh, Jeff G4FKA says, what balance did you use? Uh, Uh, he's okay. interested in the lightweight balloon for, for his home stage. Okay, uh, everybody had doubts. I'm a balloon design guy. I have all my QRO balloons. I have a collection here in my shack, uh, but they are weighty. You know, so uh, let me see because I put an insert there. Well, I think I've lost. Uh, uh, okay, I forgot to put uh, the 17 meter antenna. Anyway, uh, it's a it's a diamond. Um, if you wait uh, for me, I can tell you it's a it's a diamond BL60 or BU60. They have two models. Uh, Let me see. I suppose we should say at this point, other balloons are available. Um, yeah, well, this one is, is very small. Uh, it's, uh, it's made by Diamond, you will see. Uh, it takes 1.2 kilowatts. Uh, I did some tests here with a dummy load uh, on 40 and 80 uh, uh, on the higher frequencies, which was my case, 17, 15, and 20. They worked incredible, and they are very light. Very, very light. So you could put up those in this. That's the one. I think so. Uh, how can I see that? Yeah, we can see it. We can, I can see it on my screen. Yeah, the Diamond Martin BU50. Martin has it for sure. <laughs> I don't know if I bought it there, actually. Wait. Uh, 
Okay, and Terry, G3VFC says, uh, what about the wind? Was there much wind while you were there? Uh, two of the five days were beautiful. That's when you see the beautiful pictures. And uh, two were miserable, miserable. Luckily, our, our tents withstood, but the antennas every three hours... Oh, the for the you know the the Huma Juma three is shouting. Okay, what band? Forty. Boom. The, the you know the antenna was down. Uh, we had some some strong winds, but not crazy winds. Uh, withstandable, you know. Okay, um, I've got a message from Cole McGowan. He says seventy three from J W stroke O J zero Y. Do you know ah. uh, Carl? He's, uh, he must have operated from that part of the world as uh, as well. Yeah, a lot of uh, Scandinavian hams and German hams go to Svalbard. Uh, it's the, I think it's easy to get a license, to a reciprocate license, or you operate J Whiskey Slash. Uh, and you always get kind of a pileup. It's a rarish among the non-rare ones, you know? Yeah. Uh, have you got any more planned? Any more uh, expeditions? Yes and no. I'm, yes, no. I'm. I need to focus on my businesses, and I'm. Uh, I have to finish the movie, especially. Uh, I'm on the waiting list of two, and uh, I'm starting to plan a third. Uh, but uh, there are some political concerns. I can't talk a lot, but I'm going to be doing the expeditions until I get out of ham radio. I I'm a DX chaser. That's what I really like to do. If there's a new one, I'm there and I wake up and I still have the same drive and illusion as only eight years ago when I got licensed, you, even though I started as a kid in Peru, but it was pirate thing. <laughs> uh, so <I> will. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I will do, I, I will definitely keep doing them uh, uh, for sure. I might, me, might move soon to EA6 uh, for good. Okay. I'm finally convincing my XYL here, my wife. So um, I will have finally my short EA call uh, from EA6. So I will drop this horrible one. <laughs> just, just across the water. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, look, um, it's been great talking to you. Your enthusiasm for life is, is fantastic. Um, and uh, I know you can't talk about the, uh, the new uh, uh, de-expeditions, but um, just say, will they be somewhere warmer where you don't need a gun? Mm, uh, two yes, one no. <laughs> one one colder. <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, I, it's just that I'm not in uh, one of them, and I, you know, it's a, uh, it's a big question mark. Uh, I'm I'm up for offers. <laughs> you oh, know, uh, right. I'm uh, I'm happily happy to jump. Uh, to anyone, if the team is good and the place is promising, uh, and I can find the time, of course. Well, look, good luck with the rest of that movie, making that movie. Good luck with the rest of uh, your life. I hope you managed to get to EA6, just across the water. Uh, it's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks ever so much for your uh, for your time and giving us a flavour of what it's like to go on an IOTA expedition to somewhere very, very cold. Alan, thank <laughs> you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and an honor. Bye-bye. Ciao. Great stuff. Bye-bye now.